collaborator with several of us. Uh, we welcome him back to the research to be a part today. Amit is a professor at um, um, Ohio State, Wright State University. <laughs> yeah. Um, he is uh, he's an entrepreneur, he's a researcher, has a lot of students, educator, and uh, currently he's the Lexus Nexus Eminent Scholar at uh, Wright State University at the Ohio State of Excellence in uh, Knowledge Enabled Computing uh, Lab. And his area of research uh, uh, spans across social, sensor, semantic, data, web 3.0, and all of those areas. And he is very much into building real world applications in various domains, including healthcare, life sciences, cognitive science, and material sciences, and so on. So it's a pleasure to have Amit here with us today, and several of his students are here at IBM Research. Uh, uh, so, and several of your summer students have worked here with us. So, we're glad to have you here. And Coming in, uh, I saw that conference room, uh, and uh, I remember having a meeting with the Web Fountain. Uh, I think this was 2002, if I remember correctly. And uh, we had integrated, at that time, uh, I had started a company in 1999. Uh, uh, initially it was Tali, then it became Bokeh, then it became Semagics. And um, uh, we had developed this. Uh, uh, semantic search engine, semantic browsing, semantic advertisement, or, or sort of semantics driven uh, targeting and advertisement. Uh, we had a patent in 2000 and, uh, filed for 2000-2001. In fact, it had this idea of uh, creating very large um, uh, knowledge base. Uh, we call it uh, in the patent world model and ontology. We call it both. And um, uh, using that background knowledge, we could improve uh, the search. So. Uh, the general idea, today you can see that Google Knowledge Graph or Knowledge Graph, you know, that's generally the same uh, form of ideas. And um, uh, Web Fountain had amazingly scalable infrastructure compared to what we had, because we were a startup with 30 people. Uh, but the mining was shallow and ours was deeper, you know, uh, understanding of content, so they were complementary and it was very interesting. Of course, we uh, know that business-wise, uh, things change. Um, Again, the Watson things. Uh, that uh, brings me to uh, this uh, group, group of uh, folks. Uh, you have some of these guys working for IBM. Uh, Meena, Kartik Ramakrishnan, Pablo Mendes. They are, uh, I think Kartik is the uh, car trouble, so he's, he's on his way. Uh, and all the three, I think, are in this Watson group. Uh, I don't know exact official thing, but I believe that Watson group is the division. And Pratik Jain is at Watson, and then Ningtan. So the first four are uh, my former advisees. Uh, Ningtan is an advisee, was an advisee of a colleague of mine, Shojan Bank, and he's in the Watson MP at uh, IBM Austin. Also have Sujan, who is my current uh, student, uh, doing internship here, so it's a wonderful, it's been great synergy working with IBMers. Um, uh, many of you may not know about Rice University, but uh, I would uh, uh, like to introduce that to you, uh, uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, not that well known a university, uh, and yet uh, you might be surprised to see that uh, in the area of World Wide Web, uh, we compete with the best, uh, which is unusual. We are very small. We started web research only in 2007 when I started the Noesis Center, and uh, we've been able to do very impactful uh, 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 work. And maybe that's why you have hired our graduates. Um, and uh, uh, I've been blessed with a wonderful uh, research group. Uh, these are some of my PhD students. There are some masters and bachelors that are not shown here. And um, uh, the, uh, a number of them have helped uh, with the talk that I'm going to be presenting. So I'll be presenting their work. Um, what is interesting about um, our research group um, is that uh, we are another non-traditional uh, a research, academic research group. Um, it may be partly due to uh, kind of where I come from. I was um, in Honeywell Unisys when they were in computer business, then Belcore. Uh, I've done a couple of startups. Uh, recently, two more startups have come up based on the technology that we have developed. Uh, and uh, new commercialization is happening as we speak. So uh, that entrepreneurship, the large company commercial product that came from the research, all that and of course academic stuff, uh, all of them have come together. So uh, as I was seeing myself, uh, uh, 
I noticed that uh, almost everything we do uh, is related to issues of uh, uh, the topics related to things of large impact, human or social development, uh, or other scientific uh, issues um, that drive. So I tend to pick the topics that have clear uh, impact on the world. Almost all projects, so probably all projects we have, have real domain partners. What that uh, has happened, what that has led to is this interesting thing here. If I may, so um, uh, just to give you a sample of the kind of uh, projects we do. Uh, this project, uh, so we have, have domain partners, uh, partners in different uh, domains, and uh, we have access to real data. Of everything we do has real data and real world scale data. Uh, and um, you know, it was interesting. I was visiting uh, IBM, I was visiting Park, and uh, when I said I have access to millions of patient records, they said, well, we don't have that. And uh, you know, Sujan there has actually worked on uh, uh, real you know, patient records. Uh, uh, to the partnership uh, with a company that has taken the work that Sujan and others have done and has resulted in commercial product. Uh, and it's about computer assisted coding of IC, for ICD 10 uh, and computer uh, computerized document improvements. That's what those are the products that they have. And, and then we are able to actually uh, do the research, and of course we publish, but that is not the end uh, for us. And then we uh, create the tool or technology and deploy it, for example, in this case, um, uh, reducing rehospitalization of chronic heart patients, ADHF, um, acute decomposite heart failure patients, uh, is a $17 billion uh, a year problem for US healthcare industry. Uh, and uh, we work with the chief of cardiology medicine at uh, Wexner Medical School at Ohio State University, uh, the guy who has done 100 clinical trials. And uh, our kit gets uh, tested with the real patients uh, uh, that are researched from the hospital and so on and so forth. I'll talk more about it later on. And um, uh, recently, the president has uh, you know, started this uh, or, or announced this material genome initiative. Again, uh, we had just recently a workshop. We have people from General Electric and uh, Pratt and & Whitney and Lockheed Martin, all those guys work on advanced materials. And uh, we get to work with, the, uh, again, real data, deploy our tool between the people who do uh, you know, uh, create advanced material and those uh, OEMs that create, let's say, aircraft wing or things of that nature. So, uh, our work may be excess control, provenance on, uh, you know, uh, and ontologies for material science, but it gets uh, used in this kind of stuff. This is one of the very exciting projects. Uh, the, the reason it's exciting is because um, we've achieved a real uh, uh, impact here also. Uh, we had, uh, there were about 15 uh, major media articles on the system um, recently. The last thing was that we worked with, um, uh, uh, one software from this got uh, integrated with Ushahid. Uh, Ushahid is the most important uh, 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 organization in the world of, for crisis monitoring and management. And um, uh, uh, our, uh, we provide service to Ushahid, this crisis net, a new initiative they have. It's called Fire Reso fire hose of crisis data, and that uh, leads to, um, uh, uh, you know, so, so that they will know when people are asking for help or when the people are going to offer help in the context of a particular crisis or disaster. And then um, uh, uh, I work with some other practical things. Uh, for example, during the recent uh, Indian election, uh, the technical team of uh, Narendra Modi, uh, the person who became prime minister, worked with us. Uh, and um, ask fantastic questions uh, that, that uh, we got to learn exactly how people want to use this kind of stuff. So my assumption about how our social media analysis can help did not exactly work the way they wanted us to use. And I'll be happy to talk about that. If you ask me a question, I'll go into a lot more detail on, 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 on what we learned from that. But the most exciting thing is the latest project we uh, have launched, which is working with United Nations Development uh, uh, a Group on uh, uh, gender-based violence. A really major problem. Uh, you see the news all around, and very disturbing news. You see things in India and Nigeria and Pakistan and uh, all these things. So uh, we are working with them closely um, uh, with the idea of understanding um, the, the violence against women 
uh, worldwide. Uh, we focus on Philippines, India, uh, Nigeria, and South America right now, South Africa right now. Uh, but basically, it gives us very deep insights into the kind of uh, problems, uh, categorization, many, many other things. And that will uh, allow us to present the data right to the policymakers. And hopefully, that will lead to some important policy decisions. Um, uh, and, and so on and so forth, you can, you know, this was, this was another a very exciting project, uh, Prescription Drug Abuse Online Surveillance in Epidemiology, where again we work with epidemiologists in uh, our School of Medicine, and um, uh, we do all kinds of NLP things with web forum data, very hard, when people who are abusing drugs uh, and painkillers, uh, the their text is very hard to uh, understand, right? Uh, you can imagine that. And um, uh, here is a, an example of what we found. We found that people who were abusing certain kind of opioids were using lopramide, uh, the, uh, the Imodium AD kind of uh, you know, medication, in 10 to 20 times prescribed dose to manage the withdrawal side effect from the use of opioids. Right? So, and this was a true medical discovery because medical science, uh, you know, the community did not know about it. Once we published work, uh, we heard from doctors saying, oh, you start to see this kind of stuff. And that's very exciting. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and some more uh, things along that line. So uh, we keep on uh, doing um, that kind of characterizes this. I should, that should be enough. Uh, uh, please do uh, feel free to ask questions and uh, uh, as I think we have time available for conversations. All right, now the next five, six slides I'm going to breeze through because uh, none of you need any introduction here. So uh, how much data? Uh, massive amount, you guys know that, uh, 10 times uh, growth in a year in some cases. But here's an interesting thing, whether you know or not, uh, just about 0.5% of all data gets analyzed, right? So this all this data that is out there, in 2000, as you know, in 2008, we uh, surpassed the capacity to store the data that we produce. So um, um, being able to analyze the data is a very important thing. And um, I think this um, uh, uh, approach that we have, where we store all this data into, uh, and create massive data source and go back to analyze, that will increasingly become outdated, right? Because you just can't store all the data, right? So you've got to find the data uh, as it is being produced and uh, create abstraction from that. This term abstraction is something I'll keep on coming back to in my talk. Now, the other interesting thing is the variety. So volume, uh, my, my view, and not everybody may necessarily agree, my view is that volume is an easier problem to solve. Generally speaking, can throw computing power to solve the volume problem. The harder problem to solve is the variety problem. You have all different kind of data. And the issue here is that, and I've been working in uh, data integration for a long time, since 80s. Uh, it goes back to that, in the days I used to work on so-called federated databases, and I used to work, uh, visit this uh, wing, database wing that is out there. I see Mohan in the thing. Uh, uh, had come many times uh, uh, you know, when the, I was working database. Um, and um, one simple observation is that practically all variety problem, all heterogeneity problem require a human involvement at some level. You just can't say, here is big data, here is my mining algorithm, here is my machine learning algorithm, give me some patterns and I'll look at it. This isn't about that. You really have to, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, give some guidance on the mappings you might need or uh, things of that nature. Another comment I would make <coughs> is that vast majority of the work on integration, whatever that is, has been done with the unimodal data, data of the same modality. But nothing in the world really is the uh, same modality. You take uh, any event, you take anything out there, you have photograph for that, you have the video for that, you have text for that, all kinds of different multimodal data will be there. And increasingly, we are, you know, uh, the system will become multisensory, as the human are multisensory. So, um, uh, how do you minimize human involvement, uh, or how do you most effectively use human involvement in solving the data problem is an important thing. Uh, velocity is another major problem. Um, I won't talk too much about it today, uh, and just a little bit later on. Uh, here are just some of the questions that um, you know uh, people have asked in the early days of this big data uh, problem, and I'm sure uh, many of you in this area would have asked these kind of questions. Um, and there are huge amount of technologies, okay? all kinds of technology. Even the database technologies, you have 
relational databases, and this NoSQL and NewSQL, and uh, graph is again, you know, uh, becoming extremely important uh, right now, um, and, and so on and so forth. So the, all these technologies are there, that's fine. And there have been some, uh, uh, a decent number of uh, success stories. So uh, we've done something interesting. Uh, there was a recent article about uh, the failure of Google uh, flu trends, uh, but the natural environment they did a pretty good job uh, at that time. Um, and some of you may have seen the stories of the nature article that came about the uh, uh, flu trend. But what is missing? And this is, I think, the crux of what I'm going to talk about. So by and large, we have um, uh, focused on business intelligence and targeted analytics need. And yet, there are a large number of uh, challenges uh, not yet addressed to serve complex individual and collective human needs. Right? Uh, so um, uh, the examples would be empowered human in health, uh, fitness and well-being, better disaster coordination, personalized smart energy, and many other things of that nature. So this is a, a huge underserved uh, uh, population of applications uh, where uh, I think there is um, a legitimate and important and growing role of this big data, uh, uh, and that is what I will come to. So there are many opportunities, many uh, challenges. Um, how do you create highly personalized, individualized, and contextualized? Now, that may be in an industrial setting also. It may be that a, a port worker working in um, uh, you know, logistics related to, or somebody working in logistics related to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, containers uh, and then uh, shipping um, may need uh, better uh, latest knowledge to make the decision. So, may be individual making a decision for business, but also the things <coughs> that individuals uh, do for their own interests and needs. Also to incorporate real world complexity in multimodal and multi-sensory nature of physical world and human perception. My own uh, view is that uh, no big data, uh, more data just alone cannot be, uh, 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 cannot solve your problem. You do need to develop better algorithms. My own view is that uh, Big data cannot replace the human judgment, uh, as some of others have also said similar thing. Others uh, feel that, give me, remember that uh, article, uh, a couple of uh, uh, friends, uh, people I know well, have written on uh, unreasonable effectiveness of big data. General idea was uh, Alan Halabi and Raghu. Mm -hmm. yes, uh, and general, um, uh, you know, thesis was, give me all, you know, all your big data and we'll tell you what is all to know from the, that big data. Right? So I think I think that, is, that just, just, just doesn't go that way. Uh, I'll come to that more uh, as I go along. So, uh, and the other important thing is that it's not just converting data into information that is sufficient. And what, what I underline and highlight is the need for actionable information. There's just so much data out there that um, also here's interesting thing for you to know. That is usually not what people are looking for. And remember, I'm not talking about people like you and I and technologies. I'm talking about a farmer. I'm talking about um, you know uh, uh, a healthcare worker in the field. Okay. And uh, so the important thing is that uh, there be, there's so much of the data, and I'll show you some real world applications. The need is to convert that data into contextually relevant, um, actionable information. Something that they need to act upon at uh, that moment. And that going from information to actionable information is the challenge. And that's why the semantics and the kind of stuff that I love to do are really come into picture. So you can kind of go from data to information, but an action, uh, you know, for example, that you suppose happen to believe in Apple a day it keeps the doctor away, then what action you might take in that regard is very important. Now, here, you know, so in that context, I've been reading this uh, interesting book and uh, uh, learning from, uh, we do have a collaboration with cognitive scientists, but learning from you know, things like this is something called, you might have heard about uh, left brain and right brain. This is about bottom brain and top brain. And um, uh, the, uh, um, think about, so, so, so what it talks about basically is that um, we have this kind of process of learning from all the data that is coming in. And in computer, uh, computerized parlance, it will be like finding patterns, so mining or machine learning. And then we have these processes of top, the top brain processes, which plans, which uh, you know uh, uh, has um, uh, uh, applies the knowledge to say what are my options, which has the heuristics, which looks for options, things of that nature. And so that is more like um, the things we do with data and knowledge and the reasoning of that. 
And, uh, uh, you know, unlike uh, some people who say, you know, purely put all their faith in machine learning, or others who put all their faith in reasoning and declarative processing. I think what, just the same way our brain, uh, and as these kind of books discuss very well, combines all these things. We need to develop, uh, uh, you know, solutions, and perhaps that these kind of solutions will be necessary for IBM's own vision in cognitive uh, science and computing. Um, we need to combine this, uh, you know, reasoning, uh, this, sorry, this process uh, in, in a very seamless way. So uh, when you have this kind of thing, take this little example. We, of course, uh, you know, all of you have heard about this Internet of Things. We will have sensors, of course, interfrigerated and everything, right? That will talk to the web or Internet and uh, uh, will know that you alone know Apple. And that, uh, how do you take that information or data, whatever you want to call that, and then really tell you right at the time that you need to make a decision when you are at the grocery shop that maybe you want to stop off on the app. So is that data, uh, you having to go to your uh, application, say, what, what is in your fridge, that doesn't work. Right? You don't want to go to grocery store and say, uh, oh, give me all the data about all the things in my fridge, and then he said, no. The idea is to convert that into something that you can actually apply. And the interesting thing is that it's not even that simple. Yes, you may want to replenish with Apple, but you say, no, Apple is good, but Pear is also good, or something else is also very good. And I've been sick and tired of fitting Apple all this time. And today I want something else. <laughs> so human cannot be replaced, right, of, from the, all these things, uh, uh, how you know. Um, so the idea is that you have this contextual information that makes sense to human, not just to machines. Uh, 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 we have uh, probably the largest group in US in so-called semantic web, but uh, I don't talk too much about that anymore. Because we really apply symmetric a lot more than just work on reasoning. Uh, and the point here is that I'm not just interested in making machines understand and make machines smarter. But that is an issue of uh, interest also, uh, and I can understand its value. But I'm not actually interested in replacing humans either. I'm not. I'm interested in making it easier and better for the humans. I think I saw this uh, just walking in your lobby. Uh, Science and data for enhancing human capability, right? Something along that line. I think that's that's on the mark. So uh, I want to have this information make sense to human and that is actionable for timely and better decisions. I call that smart data. Now it so happened that um, I, uh, I, in fact, I, I wrote something about smart data when I had to give talk uh, you know, in 2001, so in 2011. And then I googled and I found myself, my own article uh, a while ago. So when I had this company, I did have, I had used this word smart data. At that point I used it to, as a formulation of smart data strategy for providing services for search, explore, and notify. Uh, and then use ontologies and you know, background knowledge and data refers to gain relevant insights. That's what I talked about. And you can see here, you have this uh, ontologies or knowledge graph or things of that nature. It's really thing very different. You have all kinds of heterogeneous data coming in, and you have all this semantically annotated data. And you guys work on annotation uh, extensively, I'm sure, and I know. And then, with all that annotated data, you can do, you know, smart something, smart search, or whatever else you want to do, or find a pattern, or find who knows what, uh, or who is the expert on the topic. All these things can be done when you have done that. So, my 2013 detect was uh, smart data makes sense out of big data. It provides value from harnessing all these Vs, volume, velocity, variety, uh, veracity, of big data in terms of providing actionable information to improve decision making. Uh, there's another take on that also, which is uh, that smart data is focused on actionable value achieved by human involvement in data creation, processing, and consumption phases for human, uh, improving human experience. Um, uh, and I, I talked about in 2008 uh, 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 something I call computing for human experience. The whole idea is that I'm really interested in not making, as I always say, machine smarter or um, even computer human uh, uh, collaboration. Those are also interesting things. Uh, but um, I'm most interested in uh, how uh, computers uh, serve the human needs uh, and to make human life better, to make human experience better. So uh, one way of looking at that is uh, to think about this of human, by human, and for human. 
And so, for example, nowadays, we have this uh, data of human, human activities. So much data of human activities coming from the physical, you know, monitoring of physical activities, monitoring of activities on the web, monitoring of social activities. I have near, I could have near field communications, uh, and then that would tell me uh, you and I have met. Um, I would um, uh, in the in the in a topic on understanding stress for a freshman medical students. I would measure the not just the sleep. But uh, you know, and the physical activities uh, and fortified self. But I will also uh, measure the social activities. Uh, how much time you spent meeting your friends during the day, right? Uh, I talked about uh, physical, cyber, social computing uh, in that context. So all your data uh, uh, of all these different uh, types uh, that are coming in this massive amount of data is being created, and being here in the valley. You have seen probably the growth of all these uh, devices company and the sensor companies and you know, things companies. Uh, at the um, the, uh, the biggest of these uh, things, CES and uh, SSXW, the two most important terms were the hashtags were related to uh, internal things and personalized digital health, digital health, right? So, uh, and the second thing is uh, by the humans. So humans are, uh, you know, Creating the data uh, in an organized form, they put in the database, we can put it in the Likopon data, uh, humans collaborate on creating Wikipedia, this massive growth in this Linkopon data, more and more data being published on the web for others to use in the context. So for example, uh, during Hurricane Sandy, um, uh, we had to uh, look at the tweets that came from near a subway station that was allegedly flooded, right? Because uh, there can be tweets and uh, there were a lot of uh, 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 problem with veracity, a lot of problem with people, you know, uh, sending rumors and false information. So one way to handle that would be to say, did the tweet come from near, so is it likely that this is a, a eyewitness, uh, rec you know, a record or observation uh, of an eyewitness? And so then you will say, hey, it came from very, you know, within, uh, 100 meters of uh, survey, and so the uh, data for location of survey stations came from uh, data published by um, uh, New York City and put up on the web. Right, so you're using that kind of data in understanding the you know other data, the tweet that is coming in uh, and addressing uh, that kind of thing. And for the human, and this is the most important thing. So uh, in the case of asthma healthcare application. Uh, we would have a detection of events such as visiting sound and indoor temperature or data rather, humidity and many other things. But really what matters is to give this kind of actionable information or lead a human to make this kind of, uh, uh, you know, to, to come to this conclusion that close the windows at home during the day to avoid carbon monoxide in gush to avoid asthma attacks at night. This is what is important. Uh, the reason that they quantify itself and the reason that the internet things as it is for the health, all these mobile applications, the reason that they will fail is because they create all the data. They will give you, uh, or, you know, how many steps you walk, but you take three of them and all, all of them give you different information. That's one thing. Secondly, so what? I walk 9,000 uh, you know, steps or 11,000 steps. It doesn't tell me about how does it really impact my health. Is it sufficient? Did it change something? about my health that I am concerned about, that really has to be brought into uh, you know, our, our decision, our, our process, our, our decision making. So uh, something that you can act upon, something that really matters to you. Uh, i take another example uh, from uh, the uh, smart energy uh, context. You, I can have so much data, electricity usage over a day, device at work, um, power consumption, cost to kilowatt per hour, heat index, Related unity, all this kind of data, right? And, and, and tweets and other things. What matters is this thing. Washing and drying has resulted in significant cost since it was done uh, during peak load period. Consider changing uh, this time to night. And do that or not uh, when uh, the difference is only 2% in saving. Because you know the, you're know not going to change human behavior with 2% saving. Do it only if you understand that there's more than 10% saving is what might uh, you know, lead the human to change his behavior. So these are the challenges that you have to do to lead for, from this data into actionable information. 
So here is the, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, thesis that everyone and everything has big data now. It's the smart data that matters. So um, uh, today, uh, as much as time permits, and uh, you know, uh, I'll give you some examples from these different spheres. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about Astro application. I'll uh, talk about uh, uh, crisis coordination in social media. I'll talk about uh, a smart cities uh, uh, application. Um, let's look at uh, asthma uh, using our K health system. K is, it stands for knowledge. Uh, so there's also a lot of N health uh, or N you know, uh, things. And uh, this is a, a K health is a system that uses uh, mobile computing, but also internal things of sensors and knowledge bases uh, you know, uh, to solve very specific problem. So here, uh, it, uh, you know, collecting health observation so perspective is that for a long time, you know, disease were treated only by some external observations. In around 185, things changed. We got stethoscope, and uh, first, of, you know, doctors started to take, um, you know, uh, external observations first beyond, sorry, uh, external observations, you know, observation, uh, observations from the body itself. In the last, just a very, few, you know, two, three, four, five years, things have changed. You know. Significantly, this thing is really uh, 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 going at a mind block, uh, you know, boggling speed. Uh, the amount of data that some humans are creating about their own physical activity is, is uh, uh, just significant. And I, I've been impressed. I've been uh, monitoring from the start of this kind of movement, but the growth is simply something that has in my own wildest dreams. So, so people are using all these kind of devices, and the amount of data that they are creating, in fact. Until last three, four, five years, much of the healthcare data was created by patient interacting with the physician. Now, suddenly, in an increasing number of cases, majority of the data has been created outside of any uh, clinical enterprise, outside of your you know, interaction with patient, uh, with the doctor. It's created under your own control by use of your own devices. This is uh, something very significant. Some of you might have seen this. If you did not see this, let me, uh, uh, let me recall the following. This gentleman um, uh, is Larry Smart, um, professor of computer science at UCSD. And he is this quantified self buff. Um, and uh, he himself diagnosed that he has Crohn's disease. He observed through his measurement that he has some inflammation in some body, somewhere in the body, and then the smart guy, he read up literature and uh, he came to conclusion he has Crohn's disease. And so he goes to doctor, not for diagnosis, but for treatment or management in this case. It's not a disease you can uh, uh, remove, but uh, you can manage. So uh, now Larry is a smart guy, and uh, you know the point here is what Larry did for himself. A um, lot of knowledge that he has and can gain on his own. I expect this to be done for a common man, a common person, or you know, anybody um, who doesn't have medical knowledge, who is not so savvy and going to the bed and reading literature, medical literature, that the devices in the field will collect enough data that even um, you know, a person in rural India would be able to uh, have some help. And they can, of course, consult the doctor saying, you know, uh, uh, can you please verify or something along that line. This is far different from telemedicine. Uh, uh, if, uh, if there is any confusion there, we have, uh, uh, we have to discuss more about it. So, uh, and then in the K-Health, what we want to do is, um, uh, so we want to do physical monitoring and analysis. Now, what we want to do is, we want to use our cell phone, our mobile phone, uh, as the uh, primary device to uh, make this happen. Why? Because for the first time in humanity, there is a device, a tool, that more than half the humanity has, right? Never in the entire history we had any tool that was available to more than half the humanity. This is the very first time that that has occurred. And by 2017, uh, those uh, smartphones will be the measure. Right now, cell phones are measuring. By 2017, smartphones will be measured. So uh, when everybody has this tool, why not use that? And that is an important implication that I'm not going to use cloud computing as my vehicle for doing intelligent processing. I'll come to that later. So, uh, in the uh, area of uh, ADHF, uh, it's a $17 billion <coughs> thing 
25 percent of the patients re, uh, uh, released from the hospital with the uh, uh, acute decompensation heart failure get back to the hospital, are readmitted hospital within 30 days, and 49 percent get readmitted within six months. Each readmission costs on the average fifty thousand dollars, eight to ten thousand dollars a day of hospitalization, six days on the average. And of course, the cost on the human health and the suffering on the human health. Right? And uh, because I also uh, 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 deal with some business, and I'm, I'm not only a pure scientist, I look at the business issue, whether the time is right to work on that. Well, C uh, 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 the Medicare, uh, the uh, you know CMS, uh, uh, started to reduce uh, reimbursement for rehospitalization for heart patients in starting October 2013. So the hospital themselves, who are just getting paid, they didn't care about human suffering, they were just getting paid by providing service. If the patient comes back, good, they will make more money. Now that won't happen. Now they have the incentive to solve the problem. So this was an important problem for us to work on. The other, uh, the other one that we are working on is asthma. 300 million people worldwide are affected by this problem, this disease. Right? And uh, it's all this statistics. So for asthma, we have this kit. Uh, we have sensor drone. We have it which has nine inbuilt monitor. Monitors. We have uh, in the pulmonological uh, diseases. Uh, the uh, doctors told us uh, none of these are something that I imagine or my students imagine. These are all done with the real clinicians. So so uh, they said, well, uh, exhaled nitric oxide measurement is important. So we have this node sensor, uh, but also we get a data from pollen level data from pollen.com, air quality data for, from air egg, uh, uh, I forget the name, uh, air now, <coughs> weather, uh, uh, weather data, temperature, humidity, uh, other other data, population, uh, and we get the tweaks and other things in this domain. Okay. So uh, with that, we have these personal level signals. We have public level signals coming from either hospitalization rate and other information like that. And we have population level signals. So think about it. You have this disease, uh, very common disease, affecting so much, but you have so much data, and some of it is highly personal level data, and some of it is data that is relevant to uh, 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 everybody. But again, only the data near you is what matters to you. So it's again, even though it's a you know data out there in the web, uh, data for Poland for you and me are different because you are interested in the you know colon in this area, and I'm interested in colon in data, right? So uh, that's, that's something to keep in mind. And so if you think about it, this, uh, the data that is relevant to potentially solving the uh, asthma problem is massive, it's a big data, truly really big data issue. And especially big data in the sense of complex data issue. Right? Big data problems are bigger when the data is complex compared to when they are just simple, 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 simple data. And uh, just as a, uh, you know, this is more of an academic slide, you know, there are terms called uh, cyber-physical, uh, cyber-social, and physical-social, physical-social. And they will work in this kind of two, uh, any two of these things, um, uh, more so in cyber-physical <coughs> than other areas. But increasingly, real-world events are continuous, uh, multimodal, multisensory, and observations span physical, cyber-social, all these three dimensions. So uh, I am very interested in these rich, uh, these applications that involve this very rich kind of data. So uh, in the case of asthma, for example, you have real-time health signals from personal level, public health, and population level arriving continuously in fine-grained samples, potentially with missing information, uneven sampling and frequencies. Right? And then you have the challenge of understanding relationship between health signals and asthma attacks for providing actual information, such as what these factors influence asthma control? What is the contribution of each factor? Uh, is there anything, that any, any alert for me today if before I step out of my home? Things of nature, those nature. So you have, again, uh, now this is kind of more of a high level architecture. You have all the data acquisition and aggregation. Then this is the uh, technological piece here. Uh, I'll come to these things very soon, until I go and the event uh, from social stream processing and risk models and things of the nature. And then what we want is this. We want to take medication before going to work. We want to say, contact doctors. We want to say, avoid going out in the evening due to high pollen uh, levels. These are actionable information. Okay. 
that matters, how you personalize, how you quantifies. Now, one important thing that we learn, and this is something we always believe, we really now, you know, I, I, I've been uh, interested in talking about semantics uh, since 80s, um, is that um, you need to solve this problem, you really need uh, to uh, bring in domain knowledge. Just giving you data, just using the system, uh, is not going to solve the problem. In this case, what is the knowledge? Well, the knowledge is how the protocol, medical protocol, medical guidelines. How exactly the, uh, does an asthma uh, in technician who treats asthma solve this? So this is the clinical protocol. It uses asthma control level and severity level of asthma. And then in this case, if you have mild person asthma and it is not well controlled, uh, the advice is, the guideline is to use medium uh, inhaled corticosteroid. Right. So this is the medical knowledge that you have to uh, bring into the system. And having uh, brought that into the system, uh, we have a system, I'll talk about it briefly, the semantic perception system, uh, yeah, and the thing called Intellego, uh, that uses domain knowledge and the reasoning and other algorithms that lead to something that makes sense to normal humans, non clinicians, everyday person suffering from asthma, or the parent of a child suffering from asthma. So, um, the other thing would be, so one, one, one thing would be here, the diagnostic information, how well control is my asthma, other computation of interest would be, how vulnerable is my control level today, right? And, and we want to do this in the context of uh, use of mobile phones, as I already mentioned that before. Now, to do this, uh, it's not that straightforward that can I reduce my asthma attack at night kind of stuff would have to be transformed into another series of still complex problems. Like what are the trigger, triggers? What is the wheezing level? What is the exposure level over the day? What is the propensity towards asthma? Who, what is the air quality indoors? The number of these things that have to be understood. The problem is very complex. Right? And then uh, you have all this data that I already mentioned, very complex piece of data. From there on you have to connect with all these different things. That would then uh, allow you to finally uh, give the answer, right? And so that may lead to understanding of that particular correlation of luminosity during the day, carbon monoxide level goes up, and then understanding that your, you know, door, you're keeping the doors open, uh, leading to uh, the section level information. So uh, here is the uh, one uh, level down into the uh, processing. Uh, these are all the data I already talked about, to talk you about. All the data, the, the data come in very, very different diverse forms. They are different manufacturers, they are different modality, right? So, what is, before I can do any reasonable computation, I need to get that into some, some common form. This is exactly the same reason why you do annotation of the data, right? And here, I need to do semantic annotation of sensor data. And all, all the other data that is relevant, in, in fact. So, um, uh, I started, uh, I initiated a uh, worldwide consortium uh, a group on uh, uh, sensor, semantic sensor networking. Um, and um, so I co-chaired that group and uh, that came up with um, semantic sensor network ontology. And uh, that is now uh, uh, practically a uh, ad hoc standard worldwide adopted. Uh, many, many, many systems have used that. Um, and so here, what happens is that on one hand you have this ontology or domain model or whatever you want to call it, the ground knowledge of some sorts. Uh, acquired from uh, public sources and experts, and so you can see the concepts that are relevant health signals. And then what happens is that all this data gets automatically annotated with the concepts that are relevant to that domain. So now your data is in a far more processor, processable XML class <coughs> or triple or RDF or graph format, right? That's much more amenable to processing with typed description. And so, in, you know, the, 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 the data is uh, using type, uh, you know, typing that is defined uh, using domain concepts. And from there, the computation will lead to understanding of this kind of stuff. So, what we use is uh, this uh, semantic sensor uh, networks, uh, 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 the group that uh, you know we start and uh, found it. Uh, uh, and then, um, you know, this the idea here is to model the sensor. This is a generic model of the sensor, and from there on, this is the kind of uh, high level view of the ontology. So you can see the ontology is fairly deep. And there are a lot of, lot of interesting application of this ontology. The idea is that, for example, um, 
we describe the sensors using the this model, uh, this uh, ontology. Because we describe using that, we are able to drop in the sensor on the fly. Meaning we are able to induce sensor dynamically into uh, an application, right? Because the description is well defined, right? And there are many other things like that. You can you model the data, you model the sub sensor, you model the subsystem, you model the operating parameters, and many things of that nature. This ontology is uh, complemented by the ontology uh, 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 ont or ontologies from the domain. Asthma related things that I mentioned there. And what needs to happen here, and this is a very important slide, uh, perhaps everybody knows that, but I think if not, this is very important that you have raw data. A sensor gives you number, 150. It's a tax, right? Or some number. Then you can annotate that, and you can, you know, this is label data. And whatever we like, store the label data, you may have RDF, you may have some other things. That you then you uh, interpret this data and say this is high level elevated blood pressure. For example, you might uh, have a diastolic uh, value of 95, and uh, NIH uh, says anything above 90 for diastolic is, um, uh, you know, hypertent uh, is elevated blood pressure. Um, so uh, that you uh, say it's an elevated pressure. All this can be represented in the framework of sequences network, but. A doctor typically won't be able to give you medication based <coughs> on uh, this, this uh, you know, uh, symptom. It's not yet a diagnosis, right? And it's for that, you know, elevated blood pressure could be because of hypothyroidism or because of something else. That is very important. So you, have to, you know, you have to interpret this data uh, and this abduction coming to you know explanation as to why is this elevated blood pressure, and that is where the integral uh, you know uh, comes into picture. And that is then what you can do. So interval comes from this Greek word uh, to perceive, uh, and that uh, you know uh, basically uh, this is very interesting. Um, I, I had a very successful students. My, my, some of my most successful students have come from non uh, have not come from computer science. I mean, their undergraduate was not in computer science. Right? I had a guy who uh, did um, uh, 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 bachelor's in statistics. He did computer science with me working in biomedicine, and he got hired in tenure tech faculty position at Case West University in the School of Medicine. Right? So these are you know very uh, uh, interesting things. Um, now Cory Hansen who worked on this, uh, who was hired by IoT Labs at uh, Bosch International, uh, working on some very exciting things. Uh, he's at the graduate uh, degree was in cognitive science. So uh, and in our work on cognitive, uh, you know, adaptive cognitive science or, or cognitive models. Uh, and this, uh, you know, uh, you look at this Nassi's cognitive model perception, uh, you know, just as a, a way of getting some ideas. Um, uh, central role is played by prior knowledge. So you have um, a, a, the, the abductive part of the cycle, whereby low level signals is converted into high level abstractions, and, uh, and, and uh, the, you know, you can call that hypothesis building. And then you have the uh, uh, the directive part of the cycle, uh, where uh, or you discriminate where by focusing attention on the aspects of the environment that can provide useful information to pare down from among the possible explanations or hypotheses to refine it and to further understand that. Now, brain is constantly doing that, uh, always asking, <coughs> what some stimuli uh, in observation, you always ask question uh, using background knowledge. Uh, uh, you know something to what more I need to come to a particular conclusion. Right, to, uh, uh, and here, prior knowledge comes, uh, you know, very, very, you know, becomes very important. In fact, it's indispensable. So, using this SSN, we're able to represent the knowledge like that. And these are the sensor-related stuff, and this is the, uh, you know, factual information that goes in the knowledge base. Right. So, elevated blood pressure is probably hypothalamus, and then that these things are represent here as a bipartite graph. And sometimes that may not be good enough, uh, uh, rich enough representation. But the same exact thing can be done uh, used for for weather. Okay. So um, now uh, in that reasoning process, then we have uh, you know this explanation kind of things going on. So act of choosing objects or events that best account for the set of observation you have. And uh, I've already mentioned that. And then you might have something like what we call discrimination. So focusing attention on those aspects that provide useful information. And uh, then, uh, for example, you. There's a lot more machinery there. I'm kind of skimming through. There are papers published on all these things. More than have to talk about later on. 
So, for example, when I have clammy skin, then I'm able to say, oh, it's a hypothyroidism, not hypertension, as an explanation for elevated blood pressure, which is what is important for me. Now, when we have done that, and here's the most important thing, uh, here's a takeaway, that I don't want to play at the level of data. The amount of data is so large. Humans simply don't have the capacity or interest or desire to deal with all the data. So you need to convert all the data into extremely small number of abstractions. This is called human perception. Right? So today, you will uh, just, um, just, just imagine how much pieces of data in a computerized form would you be um, uh, you know, uh, uh, exposed to just in this talk. You have video kind of coming through your eyes, you have your speech coming, your text going on. Those will be massive number of, you know, uh, uh, and, and you are going at much faster than 30 frames per second. And yet, if I ask you at the end of the lecture or talk, uh, uh, what did you get from that? All of you will be able to summarize in your own way. First of all, the summary and explanation, what you took away from my talk would be different. But they will all be relevant to you. And you will be describing them in one, two, or three topics, in one, two, or three sentences. Thus, you have the capability, uh, each of us have the capability of converting this massive amount of data into few abstractions. This is what needs to be happening. This is what needs to happen continuously all the time. <coughs> that this big data is there for everything of interest to us, our health and fitness and well-being and decisions in our work and all that. What the system has to do is to constantly convert this high amount, you know, massive amount of data that is relevant, uh, potentially relevant, into these few things that I should be bothered to, uh, you know, pay attention to. Right? That is what is interesting. And now, you know, uh, we we try to, uh, you know, initially do this using this out reasoner. Uh, and uh, one interesting thing was that uh, we decided that we were going to make all this thing done on a mobile platform. One of the simple reasons was that um, uh, we are, uh, the examples I'm giving you, you may see, are health applications. There are HIPAA laws and uh, privacy laws, and uh, I didn't want to take a chance of putting the data on the cloud, right? Um, and uh, and um, uh, it was just much easier for us to do IRBs. Facebook does not have to do IRB uh, to check our emotions, but uh, you know we have to do that in academia. I hope you guys have, you know, you heard the story about Facebook who did the experiments and emotions, right? So, uh, so it was much easier to do that way. But then when you try to run this kind of computation on mobile phone, uh, you know, big problems, eh? 15 nodes of knowledge base, uh, it turns out, and asymptotic complexity. So, one option would be we send the data on the cloud and to use massive computing resource. Not a great idea. Other is to downscale symmetric processing such that each device is capable of being machine perception. We call it intelligence at age, at the age. Why, why is there number one other? Uh, first example, first idea, is, first, first point is that, uh, you know, healthcare data, privacy issues, I just don't want to send it on the, uh, in, on the cloud. Uh, uh, because that would uh, require uh, more uh, care and you know, to the uh, IRB that indeed you are measuring, you know, keeping patient privacy. And uh, philosophically, I want uh, the, all the data and everything to be in the control of patient and not just go out. Uh, it's much easier, uh, you know, and, and a more, more clean solution in our case. And um, the other important thing is that uh, think about it. I want to give this solution to be deployed in a rural India uh, case. Uh, you know, communication is uh, bandwidth is limited. There are no one there. Uh, if I can do much of the communication uh, right on my mobile devices, my solution is far more scalable. Scalable in terms of deployment and options. Uh, maybe, of course, technically I can talk about in some other applications uh, a synergy between uh, some person here and some person in the cloud. So we can certainly talk about those things. So, so, so uh, that that is the uh, thing, and so we uh, came up with big factor encoding and their operations uh, to uh, and, and you know, to both encode prior knowledge and execute semantic reasoning, and uh, that allowed us uh, to actually go from uh, you know tens of nodes to thousands of nodes, uh, time reduced from minutes to milliseconds, and the complexity growth from linear to linear. So that was an interesting little bit of a side thing. So takeaway here would be. Translate low level data into high level knowledge or abstractions. Prior knowledge is key to the perception, uh, in the solving uh, problem for perception. And, um, uh, and uh, intelligence of the age allows us to scale massively and uh, use us very 
good uh, uh, you know, way for deploying those solutions. So uh, coming to the second um, uh, uh, topic, uh, or second example, um, social media analysis coordination, crisis coordination using the Twitter platform. Here, uh, uh, particularly, we have been interested in the uh, social good, uh, you know, smart data for social good. So we want to mine human behavior to help societal and humanitarian uh, development, crisis resource for coordination, harassment on social media, uh, gender-based violence, and things of that nature. I'm going to take the example of crisis coordination. Uh, take the example of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, even though it came towards the end of 2012, it was the second most discussed event on Facebook. 20 million tweets with Hurricane and Sandy keywords in the first week. Right? So, really large amount of data. Uh, and uh, uh, so we use a Twitter system uh, uh, that we developed uh, and um, uh, the, the keywords here. Um, <coughs> what is interesting about Twitter is, is that um, and, and in, in long genesis of this thing is uh, some work we did with IBM and Microsoft Research. Uh, with IBM, we had gotten a, uh, a few years ago, now it's been quite some time that we got, but this is U UIMA, uh, UIMA award we had gotten. And uh, in fact, Mina, uh, who is not today here, she had an appointment, uh, 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 worked on that. Um, and we also worked with IBM uh, on uh, the uh, Dan Grohl and all those guys uh, on the um, BBC Sound Index. So um, that was a follow-on to the uh, work uh, in the web fountain. And, uh, and it was very interesting, right? Uh, what are the uh, uh, tweens in London talking about? No, that, that is there, I just want to see. So, so uh, it was a very exciting project. Uh, uh, so we did some work there. And then we worked with um, uh, Microsoft Research on, um, uh, on, on advertisement issues, um, how uh, you can um, uh, intent detection. Uh, from the, the post, so that you could uh, uh, improve the target advertisement. We found that the result would be six to eight times better than uh, based techniques that we use. But the, the Twitter is, uh, uh, you know, is uh, significant because it can spatial, temporal, thematic, people content network, sentiment, emotion, intent, and more of that analysis. So there's a little bit of tweet here, and yet so many dimensions to understand. First of all, you know, it's not just 140 character, there's 2K of the packet that you can have, all the metadata. But, you know, human, um, you know, humans construct the tweet and they convey so much through a tweet, right? So it's very uh, interesting uh, thing to do. I won't, I, I won't go into much of the social media analysis here today, but uh, I'm interested in actionable, uh, the actionable thing here that I'm interested in is timely delivery of right resources and information to the right people at the right location. That's, uh, and, and, and because everybody wants to have, but they don't know how. <laughs> so um, here's an interesting insight from some data analysis. Uh, during Oklahoma tornado, uh, we got 2 million tweets during the first 48 hours. And I mean, realizing these tweets, we found that only 1.3% of, uh, of those tweets had precise resource donation request to help. And only 0.02% of uh, those had precise resource donation offers to them. Here is an example of a request and examples of uh, offers. Okay. And the, this is important, uh, you know, only if you match the request of help with the offers that you actually are achieving some purpose. Right? Um, so, so matching this, uh, and then of course you have to match based on location, type of request, and needs, and so on and so forth. If you don't, then you know you can be in second crisis. Um, at, the end of, you know, at, at Hurricane Sandy, you had so many clothes that actually created a second disaster, right? So you want to be able to match where do I go to help out from volunteer work around the moon. Anybody knows, to, I would like to volunteer today. Help is desperately needed in Swanee. Or if you like to help, call that number. Right? So matching that these things are, you know, one thing can respond to another one on the fly is very important. It is this capability that we brought as a service that has been integrated to Shahidi's crisis net. That's very exciting, I think. Um, uh, there's uh, something about continuous semantic. This is the part that deals with uh, velocity. So here the idea is that um, think about any event. Uh, none of the events are uh, going to uh, play out exactly as they are defined in the beginning. Right? So you take, uh, things change. 
the topic of uh, conversation changes. Uh, Hurricane Sandy initially, before it lands, you are going to talk about some things. While it is, you know, going, uh, you know, taking out the, the uh, trees and electricity, there's another set of conversation. And then what happens? You do not know ahead of time. There are different uh, things. It takes different path than originally anticipated, and the conversation is on totally different things. So things change. So if you started, let's say, getting on Twitter, uh, filtering using some hashtags and keywords. It's not going to really capture everything there is to be known. The, the crisis in this case uh, has different topics. How do you automatically figure out those new things and how do you do smart filtering so that you can source new content for the crisis as it um, uh, evolves? Take an example, we used to monitor 2009 um, Iran elections. And uh, a lot, there are a lot of things about the green, you know, people with the green flags and other things. Ahmadinejad and uh, Nafsanjani and all those things. And suddenly there was this event of uh, NEDA, uh, the young girl that was gone down. And there was a you know, significant different conversation. And now NEDA was nobody that you knew about that particular election. And suddenly that becomes a very important entity and something that you need to understand as a part of monitoring that event. So for that then what we do here is this life cycle um, we have a system called Barkle that uh, does a semantic processing on streaming data. And uh, that would give us uh, a bunch of uh, entities or, or key phrases or, you know, to, 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 to focus on. Using that, you can create this cloud. And you, then we have built a system, a tool called Hooser, using the, uh, the, it will take a bunch of keywords and mine Wikipedia to automatically create that domain model. So I remember uh, this is relevant to 29th of January 2011. That is the day before million person march in Egypt, you know, during the, uh, the Egypt revolution. And um, then uh, there is uh, suddenly uh, discussion about uh, Heliopolis. How would somebody like me know? I don't have uh, you know um, intimate geographic knowledge of Egypt, right? Um, so uh, here, this model tells me that Heliopolis is a suburb of Cairo. So my system now has more knowledge to work with and understand and classify the content and so on and so forth by applying this knowledge to the piece like that. So that is the uh, work on continuous semantics. You can Google continuous semantics uh, and you get to the page and all work on that here. The last one I will briefly talk about is smart cities. And the application is, of course, unknown traffic management. But the interesting thing about this one here is that we combine um, uh, both social and sensor data and the background knowledge. So to improve everyday traffic integral due to our most common problem of stuck in traffic. And uh, you know, of course, the big problem, uh, building cars by 2020, but just a 20% increase in the, um, uh, in the number of uh, cars led to 236% uh, jump in, uh, uh, sorry, 20% jump in population led to 236% jump in traffic. Right? So, Big problem, right? And, and the data is from IBM Smart uh, Traffic Insight. So um, uh, here's a problem. We, we to, to understand this, we took three months of data from San Francisco. Every minute update of speed, volume, travel time, occupancy, result in so many big status observation. Uh, we went to file11.org. We found the 730 active events and 146 schedule events, and uh, there were of course a lot of problems and challenges with the data. And so again, you have you can see the volume, velocity, all those problems. And um, the questions would be like this: Can we detect onset of traffic congestion? Can we characterize traffic congestion based on events? Can we estimate traffic delays uh, in a road network? Right. So um, this, uh, you know, we are part of uh, FP7 uh, EU's FP7 program. Uh, here are some of the partners, including some of the uh, cities, Aras uh, and uh, uh, Vaso and. Uh, and such, uh, um, and uh, uh, <coughs> here is a very interesting thing. Uh, I, uh, it was also something I was not expecting. We were able to find extensive amount of data. These are all six departments in different colors. Right? For example, this is social programs department. This is department for healthcare in city government. And um, uh, we were able to find uh, you know tweets uh, that relate to each of these different. Topics, uh, departments, and such. So this, uh, you know, we, we validated this extensive amount of social data available that are relevant to decision making related to city, and smart city projects, and smart city issues. So our architecture looks something like this. Um, we have uh, a, a, you know, part of 
was just tagging and some uh, ER. Uh, we have these locations. We have this Skype ontology from IBM's uh, Smarter City work. So, uh, and then we have five level uh, uh, hierarchy. So these are things that we have in the ground knowledge. And, um, uh, uh, and then these are the kind of stuff that you want to do when it's in any section. And on, on the way, we have to solve some interesting uh, problems. For example, you know, not uh, focus on half moon and half moon bay and brewing company, but the whole thing, half moon bay brewing company, uh, uh, is the uh, most relevant entity here, appropriate entity here. And I think that anybody who does learning uh, would know, would kind of intuitively understand that CRF is the uh, appropriate choice to larger and grand uh, problems. So that kind of stuff happened. But then, ultimately, uh, when we combined the processing of um, uh, sensor and social streams, we were able to find complementary information. For example, slow traffic from sensor data and accident from uh, textual data. That means, sensor could not tell me why the traffic is slow. But the social data told me the traffic is slow because of accident there. Right? So uh, uh, that is very good, because very often, Think about automatically um, uh, uh, taxonomy generation from textual data. The problem is labeling the nodes. How do you label the nodes, right? That's it. Kind of, uh, you know, humans are much good at uh, labeling the nodes. Uh, they, they, they have the natural language. Uh, uh, corroborative, so uh, you can get additional confidence. For example, excellent event supporting an excellent report from the ground group. Or timely, so knowing poor visibility before formal report from the ground group about slowing of the traffic. So here, uh, you know, uh, some more examples. Uh, usually, you can see complementary events and corroborating events uh, from, uh, uh, from these different sources. And then you can work towards larger things like how issues in the city can be resolved. Like what should I do when I have uh, fog conditions? Uh, what has happened in the past? Or what has been the lead time between fog detection and actual slowdown? Uh, what diversions have worked? What advisories they have many things on the website is what we need to work on. All right, so there is a takeaway here. Big data is everywhere at individual level, not just at uh, the level of company and uh, uh, corporations um, uh, and big organizations that uh, with growing complexity in I did not get talk to talk enough about in I would also admit that we need to do more concrete work uh, with multi-sensory, multi-modal data, we've done some, uh, but uh, there's a lot more to be done there. Uh, uh, I think that's, that's a very challenging, exciting research area. Uh, but we are, I gave you example of physical psychosocial uh, computing, uh, and you know, data of all this kind, and I think it's a very exciting next uh, uh, set of problems to solve. Analysis is not sufficient. Right? In effect, nobody cares about data, nobody cares about analysis. What can I do? What decision can I make? How does it affect me? That is what is going to. That is what somebody will pay for. That's very important for us to understand. Right? Bottom-up techniques. Uh, a technique is not sufficient, or set of bottom-up techniques are not sufficient. We need also need top-down processing and what background knowledge is extremely important in bridging these together and doing the reasoning necessary. Uh, focus on human and improve human life and experience. Uh, that is exciting thing. That's, that's the, uh, that is the um, uh, reason for talking about the smart data. Uh, data to information to contextual relevant abstractions. Actionable information meaning value of data. That is the value part. The five E's that you talk about, the value is be able to take action. To assess and support humans in decision making. And uh, so, you know, Big data challenges without intention of deriving value is generally without goal. <coughs> there are some more things. Uh, uh, Noesis has a pretty extensive website. You can look at the vision and number of things that we talked about. And, and, and uh, really exciting things to work with a lot of companies. Uh, about 100 researchers, uh, about 45 PhD students. Uh, all, all PhD students are funded. Uh, and uh, the interesting all the things that we work on is very exciting. Real problems out there. All right.
say how about um, in less than 20 minutes for questions. So, for us all, questions. I can give a lot of demos if you're interested in online. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have a question. Uh, at one point, you mentioned summarization. And um, I'm just uh, interested. I know that's an interest of like Rob High, who's our CEO of the Watson Division, talks about you know, how we summarize meetings. How do you measure? How do you measure, how, how do people measure a high quality summarization? Do you have any insights into that? So if you were to take your talk and each of us could generate a summarization, how would we rank order those summaries? We, we, we actually doing summarization. Uh, Sujan, do you remember exactly the problem, you know, work on summarization? <laughs> uh, uh, we have a project called Social Health Signals. And um, uh, we worked with Mayo uh, in, uh, on that, and uh, we have access to a lot of new data. Um, and uh, uh, this is to understand the consumers' uh, uh, health care uh, surge uh, and, and things. And particularly, we're focusing uh, initially on major depressive disorder and so forth. But um, I think at this point of time, um, uh, we, we might have. Uh, unusual, uh, what you call unfair advantage, uh, in that um, when you, um, so let me paint a scenario uh, as to what we are planning to do or, or trying to do or expect to do, is that when you, um, you know, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Mayo Clinic, these are, BevMD, these are major healthcare sites, so they have literally millions of queries a day, um, and um, just like any search engine can look at the results and major things, uh, you can do the same thing there. And um, uh, we, um, uh, when the search is there, um, you are trying to get a sense of what users are interested in. And you are even trying to uh, change their behavior. For example, a lot of people search on uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment, and very few search on prevention. But the medical establishment is totally clear that prevention is the most important thing that you do. So in the results, you could buy, you know, start giving them, you know, because you understand the topic, uh, you understand the results could be related to diagnosis, treatment, prevention, uh, all kinds of stuff, or procedures, uh, that you would adjust the results, and then you can, of course, measure the things that you have. Now, in the same kind of environment, you can give a summary of the things as to why, uh, what, is it, what is the relevance of that result? So in the days of uh, Tali and my company, uh, we used to call rich media objects, meaning uh, the object that is relevant to the query or search or browsing uh, uh, is a, it will give the description of all the stuff, which is exactly what you see today in Google's result of that. Uh, they call it, um, what do they call it? They call something else. Um, but uh, there, clearly, you don't want to give the whole Wikipedia page, right? Even if you go to the internet, so you're going to summarize something. And, and that would, of course, you call that uh, a lot of different things. Uh, one thing would be all the queries on that particular topic, generally that user has asked, uh, let's say depression. Or you would uh, uh, also uh, try to understand the categorizations that we understand of this disease. And then you summarize. Uh, so it's very clear. Uh, I, I should let others ask questions. But what I was looking for is like um, data compression as a well thing. Summarization isn't so well defined because of something you said, which is everybody has different knowledge. So, what's a good summarization for one person might not be a very good summarization for another person. So, it is personalized, it has to be personalized eventually. Although, you know, in a second, yeah. I saw this looking at the use of sort of first principles of simulation models as a way of uh, encapsulating both uh, prior knowledge and abstraction combine that with techniques such as stochastic optimization to channel that knowledge towards making decisions. So the goals seem very, uh, so, so this is like super top down, I guess, in your, in your setting. One, one example is uh, data simulation techniques to combine, say, sensor data with an agent-based uh, model of uh, drivers. Like the idea in Kyoto Lab has done a simulation of every car in Kyoto. So um, one question was, if, have you sort of looked at that those sort of aspects of the, uh, of the techniques we're incorporating. 
I have not, but that looks a rather refreshing idea. So certainly we should uh, think more about that. Um, no, I mean, I don't, but it sounds intriguing. I'll, I'll, I'll um, sort of add to that and to, to Jim's, Jim's point or your point about the, um, the role of the person's knowledge. And as it struck me with a number of your examples that the level of advice that you want is very different depending on who the individual is. And maybe that's really easy to see in the traffic example where today Google leaves, you know, Google will give me the map of the traffic and will show me where the accidents are and they are reported from the social media. You're right, so it just does that. And then you're on your own. And if you're an expert in the area, you know enough to get off at the next exit, because you know there's a, another route, and Google will immediately start climbing on that other route. Um, but if you're not, and you're scared, you stay with the course or whatever, right? But how do, you, how do you take these ideas that you have and turn them into kind of more of a partnership with the human, so they can adjust to what the human knows? and or is there a way to, to do that? We're, we're kind of interested in this notion of the, the computer not as our advisor, but as our assistant here. And so how do we how do we help get, how do we leverage all the cool work you're doing to get us better help with this assistance? This is a fantastic question. In fact, I have another talk on computing for human experience, and I looked at this whole thing about uh, machine uh, solving, replacing human to a machine being pure <coughs> in assistant and uh, you know many different people have talked about it Vanero Bush to uh, uh, you know uh, Minsky and maybe you know people others uh, and I'm very interested in uh, understanding the synergy between humans and the machine but to tell you the truth uh, this has kept our hands free so I have talked about it at a uh, vision level in the talk on computing for human experience and I have a paper on that but in terms of doing concrete work, I haven't done anything that uh, really, uh, uh, because, um, uh, you know, you know I, I know this asthma problem is actually being deployed. I mean, we are giving this kit to, uh, through, uh, the pediatrician is giving kit to parents of uh, children uh, that are having, that are having asthma. But at what point of time I will really understand um, uh, the parents' uh, knowledge of asthma and uh, you know, factor that in, I've not gotten there. I mean, because again, to make that progress, I would really need a lot more data about the human behavior and what he has done or she has done in the past. In the, I painted a number of uh, real problems we worked on, but none of them have uh, afforded us a real model of the human. So it's something I think we need to do, and the research, uh, we, you know, uh, really I was just gonna say, Mateo back there, uh, decision on his child's uh, asthma. I don't know. Yeah. Going to so, so, so I think, I believe that, okay, in the context of some office decision making, you might be able to gain some knowledge. I'm aware of other, uh, you know, uh, efforts also. I think I was, uh, a good friend of mine uh, did a startup in that area of, you know, analyzing emails and creating some models from that. But um, uh, the application, you know, in our lives are pretty segregated. Um, you know, uh, and uh, you know what we do at office, what we do with our spouse, uh, you know what we do with our child, uh, other excellent professional things. We bring in load pieces <coughs> of knowledge and different behaviors for each yeah, of different them. Different user model for every role. Yeah, yeah. So, right. 
Right, so, so any one, you know, generally techniques to be able to do that. In that example I gave you about Tahi square and, uh, you know, automatically creating a model for that particular situation, that kind of things can come handy because that's what, you know, we talked about creating something on image. I uh, created that from extracting entity from uh, uh, Twitter uh, tweets and, uh, you know, then going to Wikipedia and then creating a, a model that seems to be relevant to those uh, collection of tweets, right? Uh, so that kind of techniques would come handy. But then which one you apply in which context would be another problem and uh, uh, then how effective they are is something we don't yet know. But much of this will come about, in my view, uh, if it's the way I work is that I really look out, look for really good use case or scenario. Uh, and uh, for the problem that uh, you just asked, which is really also near to my heart, I haven't found one yet. Uh, so, um, uh, for example, in the depressive disorder issue, uh, these uh, users are anonymous. I don't have access to that. Uh, I can understand their certain behavior, what results they look at, but I don't know them intimately. I have no way to influence giving them more, other than just seeing this, uh, showing them different results. I can certainly show them different results. Uh, this uh, say a Facebook show would show different schemes of emotions. Uh, uh, so, so, um, uh, but, but, but the point here is, um, uh, what the other thing is, um, it is unclear to me that. Um, uh, the effort it might take to create um, understanding of that particular human in depth might pay off. It, it may not pay off. That we may want to keep it at a shallow level because at the end you still are going to rely on the human intellect. And if you think about it, the search, right? The search uh, is working only because of the you know human brain is looking at the results and picking the one. Uh, you know, if you uh, if well, one area you want to stick around that. Education applications and want to know what the student knows, huh. and so and help them plan their career. That is a like that. that is one of the better examples because uh, the domain is better defined. Okay. You have the great material, you have the expected outcome that you have. It's a number of things you can constrain, okay. and yes, uh, so that is that will be. Uh, So he will be staying on up until 1.15 p.m. So because of that, we are arranging open an open lunch meeting with him in J2601, J2601. So you're welcome to come to the lunch. So we'll have the conversation will continue. Okay. So once again, thank you for coming.